If you would, please open up your Bibles with me to the book of Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 1, as we continue this series on Trinitarian salvation uh, and on the book of Ephesians as a whole. We're going to be looking at verse 6 specifically, but I'm going to begin reading in verse 3, and I'll read down to verse 6. So the Apostle Paul writes these words in Ephesians 1, 3. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him in love. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, to himself according to the kind intention of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved let's pray gracious God I ask for your blessing upon this sermon and as your word goes forth that you would use it to change lives For the glory of Christ, your dear Son, who truly is the Beloved One, the King of all all things, the, the Lord who rules the universe, we praise Him, and we praise you through Him, Father. May you be glorified, both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. As I said, we're going to continue looking at Trinitarian salvation, and specifically in relation to the Father's role in salvation, as we find that pointed out to us here in Ephesians 1. And this is part three of that series, as we find ourselves in the last verse of this section of the book of, I mean, excuse me, of Ephesians 1, where Paul outlines the work of the Father in relation to the salvation of of the church. But we ask ourselves, what is the end of the Father's electing work? Because we've seen in the first two parts of this study that the Father, His role is to elect believers to salvation. That is, from the foundation of the world, He sees the whole pool of the human race and He sets aside a certain few unto Himself, that would be the church, or what is commonly referred to as the elect in the New Testament. He sets them aside unto Himself as His chosen people and they are to be holy unto Him. And He chooses them and He commissions His Son. The the Son agrees to the Father's will and the Father's plan and the Father's electing purposes. He agrees to come in and to die for this elect people when the time is right. And that's why Galatians 4 4 tells us when the fullness of times came that God sent forth his son. And even in eternity past, when the Father and Son agreed to do this, the Spirit was also there in agreement to their plans of redemption. And the Spirit even has a role in salvation. So the Father elects, the Son atones for, He comes in and dies for those people, and then the Spirit regenerates them and saves them and seals them. So each member of the Trinity has a role to play in the epic, in the drama of salvation. That's what's so glorious about salvation. It's a Trinitarian work. That's why this series, this study we're doing is Trinitarian Salvation because it is something that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit do together and in agreement with one another. It's truly glorious. But, as I said, what is the Father's end goal? What's His purpose? And what's the purpose of the, ultimately the Son and the Holy Spirit? Why are they all three working in this economy of salvation. Why are they working to bring the elect to salvation? What's the purpose? What's the end? What is the divine plan? What did the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in eternity past in what is commonly referred to, and I have spoken on in the previous two parts, the covenant of redemption, 
or sometimes referred to as the Council of Redemption. What was their purpose? For we know none of the members of the Trinity have ever been at odds with one another. So if it is the purpose of the Father, it is also the purpose of the Son. And if it is the purpose of the Son, it is also the purpose of the Holy Spirit. And if it is the person of the Spirit, or excuse me, if it is the purpose of the Spirit, it is also the purpose of the Father and the Son. They share the same motives. What is it? It is to bring glory and praise to to the God of all grace. It is to bring His name glory. That is the chief end of salvation, of the economy of salvation. God condescends and saves a select few unto Himself and brings them to glory to further magnify His grace, to put His glory on display. So it's for Him. It's for His own glory. Also, how is this salvation conferred unto the sinner? How is this given to the reprobate, to the ungodly, perverse, degenerate who is saved by the grace of God? How is that given to them? Well, we know it must be of total, complete grace. For the whole testimony of the Bible is that salvation is by grace from Genesis to Revelation and everywhere in between in the teaching of Jesus, Paul, Peter, the prophets, the Psalms, even the writings of Moses. It's clear salvation is by grace. Does Paul agree with this in his writing to the Ephesians? Absolutely. Absolutely does Paul agree with all of the writers of Scripture, it is beautifully harmonious that it is by grace. So let us consider these truths as we look at this passage of Scripture in this sermon, which we will. We're going to consider these things, that salvation is ultimately to the glory of God and to the praise of His glorious grace. And that is how the salvation is ultimately conferred unto us. It is by grace grace. But before we do, as we always do when we look at Scripture, we want to consider and quickly contemplate the context so that we properly interpret the author's words. The whole book of Ephesians as a whole was written by Paul to the Christians at Ephesus. Paul was writing from Rome. Many people believe he was in prison in Rome at that time, and he wrote about 60 AD. So this is just after the uh, the midpoint of the first century. It's a pretty early book. And to give us a little bit of a cultural background to kind of understanding what was a, na- a, a, a normal Ephesian thinking concerning deities and concerning God in relation to sovereignty and grace and all the things we're going to consider, just briefly... Um, the, the pagan religion that was very predominant in Ephesus during this time was the worship of the Greek god Artemis. In fact, uh, her temple sat in uh, Ephesus, and it was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And uh, this, this Greek god that they supposedly worshipped, Artemis, this false god, is a very, um, is a very bad god, pretty much, in in terms of what they considered sovereignty, and her sovereignty was very limited, and uh, and she just, she, she, as with the other gods, resembled more of a human being than they did actually divine beings, whereas we know the God of Scripture, unlike them, is, and unlike us even, is totally self-defining and independent, and he defines who he is. That's one of the things you, when you consider other gods from other religions, and specifically Greek gods, they are basically images of man. They're just projected images of what men think God is like. Of course, they're idols and they're no gods at all because they are false gods. But the God of Scripture is different, incredibly different. So that just, really, when when Paul's writing this to the Christians in Ephesus, this just obliterates uh, 
really a, a lot of these false notions that the Ephesians, maybe not necessarily the Ephesian Christians, but the Ephesian Christians would have used to have been believing before they were believers. A lot of them probably worshipped this false god Artemis, and so naturally, as they became believers, they could sometimes fall into conferring those ideas concerning that false god Artemis onto the true God. And so Paul just dispels any false beliefs concerning God and establishes who God is, his character, his purpose in salvation, his work in salvation, and how he even gives salvation, which is in grace. A quick outline, quick understanding of what's chapter 1 specifically about. Uh, the first half, at least, of chapter 1 is about God's divine blessings, specifically salvation. And uh, the first half of chapter 1 beautifully breaks down into three parts. The Father's role in salvation being election, the Son's in atonement, and the Spirit's in regeneration. This is really an amazing chapter of Scripture. I think every believer ought to know this chapter very well. I would say, memor I, would, I would encourage you to memorize an outline of Ephesians 1 because it beautifully, very orderly, very systematically shows us how the members of the Trinity work together and, and even in their own respects and their own roles separately in salvation to accomplish it. Specifically in verses 3 through 4, um, we saw the spiritual blessings that God gives us in Christ. It was verse 3, verse 4 is introduced to us, the doctrine of election. And then verse 5 is about God's adopting us in love, God's predestining us to adoption as sons and daughters in His love. And so now in verse 6, we're finally going to finish this section concerning the Father's role. And then um, verse 7, as we move into verse 7, um, next time we, uh, we go to this text scripture and study, we were, we're going to see Christ's role and Christ's work in salvation. So let us now look at the text and contemplate the truths that are put there. Let's look at the first thing I want us to consider, and that is God's purpose. And the purpose that God has in salvation is to the praise, is to bring praise to His glorious grace, to the glory of God's grace. It is all to the praise of God's grace. As Paul brings this section of the Father's work to an end, he mentions that it is all to God's glory. And it shows us something about the character of God. This aspect of salvation, namely its end, shows us something about who God is. And it is that He is jealous. Not jealous in the sinful sense some of you might be thinking. No, not in that way but in a pure way, in a righteous way, is jealous. He himself said to the ancient Israelites in the Old Testament in Exodus 20, verse 5, this is in the midst of God giving the Ten Commandments. And God tells the Israelites, He says, I, Yahweh, your God, am a jealous God. He's jealous. He's jealous for His own glory. But He's not only just jealous for that, but he's jealous for multiple things. Specifically what? What are they? Well, one thing is that God is jealous for is his people. He's jealous for his, his the love um, from his people. He desires his people to serve him and honor him and to love him and adore him and to seek him. He desires that. God's jealous for that. We see in the book of Hosea how God describes, his, especially in Hosea 2, describes his jealous love for his people. It's truly precious to consider that reality. Another thing God is jealous for is justice. God is jealous for justice. That the wicked would be punished. That the law would be propitiated. The law's demands upon the wicked would be satisfied. That, 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 that is one of the things God seeks after because he's jealous for it. That's why one day on the day of judgment, God's going to render punishment to the wicked He's going to send many to hell. And people are being sent to hell as they die every day. And God is jealous to administer that judgment. He is. That, that is a part of God's perfect 
character. Just as a judge here on earth is, is jealously seeking after, if he's a good judge at least, jealously seeking after to punish murderers and to punish rapists and to punish people who steal. It is because that judge loves justice and they're a just judge if they have such a desire and such a longing and such a chasing after of those things. How much more God, who is perfect in holiness. As a psalmist said in Psalm 119, 137, Righteous are you, O Lord, and upright are your judgments. But predominantly, what is God most jealous for? If we, if we, could, put, uh, if we could put something on the apex, something on the summit of what God is most jealous for, on the top of the pile, the first one on the list, what would it be? It would be God's own worship and God's own adoration and God's own glory. It is God is jealous to bring his own name glory, which is what we will contemplate now. God being worthy of our praise. That's why verse 6 begins. Look with me there in verse 6. It says, To the praise. Now we obviously know from verse 5 he's talking about God adopting or predestining us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself. But what is the purpose? It is to the praise of his glorious grace. Those three words at the beginning of verse 6 to the praise in the economy of salvation that's God's ultimate purpose. He indeed is concerned with the good of his people as we just contemplated we consider that but the overarching purpose it is it's like a you could say an, an umbrella that covers even the other purposes in fact Jesus Christ our Lord he himself said in Matthew 21 16 quoting out of the Old Testament he said this about the father out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise for yourself. That is what God is seeking after. Praise for His own self. And He's worthy of it. He's worthy of it. No one else is worthy of praise. No one else is worthy of worship and worthy of adoration. It is only God who is. And so when God seeks to bring glory to Himself... Who are we to contend? In fact, that's right and good. And to the heart of the believer, that is precious. And they seek after bringing him glory. As we contemplate the realities, the truths of the other verses that we, uh, the previous verses, verses uh, 5 and 4 and 3 going back, each, each truth is like a brick building upon one another, ultimately building the building of God's glory. Why does God adopt? Because He wants to bring glory to His name. He wants to bring praise to His glory. Why does God predestine? To bring praise to the glory of His grace. Why does God bestow blessing upon the sinner in Christ His Son? Because He wants to bring glory and honor and praise to His most holy name. This is a very strong theme and emphasis in chapter 1 of Ephesians. It's not just here in this verse. Paul strongly, strongly stresses this and uses the same term in verses uh, 12 and verses 14. Look with me. In, verses, uh, in verse 12, he says, To the end that we who are in the, ho the first to hope in Christ... Notice he says there, to the end. And the previous verses, he was just speaking about Christ, Christ's work. And so he says, Jesus is doing all these things and has done these things for us. To the end that we who are the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. Uh, then verse 14 concerning this is right after the Spirit's work, after he described what the, what the Holy Spirit does in salvation... He says, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with the view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of His glory. Notice, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all do it to the praise 
of his glory. And notice Paul tacks on that phrase to the end of each section there. The end here uh, in verse 6, this section concerning the Father's work. Then in verse 12, at the end of the section concerning Christ's work. And then in verse 14, at the end of the section concerning the Spirit's work. God is for God. He's for himself. Isaiah agrees with Paul. Isaiah 43, verses 20 through 21. Isaiah wrote, The beast, and this is obviously God speaking through Isaiah, so he writes, The beasts of the field will glorify me, the jackals and the ostriches, because I have given waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. I will give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I have formed, For myself will declare my praise. Notice there, God says, I form them for myself and they bring my praise. They bring praise to him. God is doing all things to bring his name glory. It is his working in the world and among the children of men to bring his own name glory. It is, you could say, uh, and maybe understand this by way of an analogy, a king working in his kingdom and conquering other kingdoms and building his kingdom and bringing good and prosperity to his people does it all to his glory so that the nations and and the people of his kingdom honor him and glorify him and reverence him as the king who rules over his kingdom in a greater fashion and manner. To a much greater extent does God do that. So that, as it is written, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Mm, indeed. How, how glorious that is. How, how absolutely wonderful that is to know God has done it all to His glory. Amen. Amen. Absolutely. Yes. And that, that, that is why for the believer it is so glorious to live for the glory of God. Because we know know that our hearts are in line with His will, because His will is to bring His name glory. And so our hearts and our minds, our desires, our intentions are in line with that. When we contemplate the glories of what God has done for us in Christ, the glories of salvation, it automatically makes us praise Him. It is a direct result. We worship because we have eternal life, not to have eternal life. Any so-called Christian who does not desire worship to worship God, they're surely not in Christ. Listen to what the Reformation Study Bible, uh, in, on, on con- com- commenting on verse 6, it says... The thought of God's almighty love leads to our extravagant outpouring of praise. How true that is. How true that is. Our lives, brethren, ought to be about this. In everything we do, our thought... Our intent should be, I want to see God praised through this thing or action or whatever you might be endeavoring to do. But concerning this this passage in question, verse 6, this broad idea is not necessarily all of what Paul's actually speaking of here. He's more specific. He's not just saying it's to the praise of God in verse 6, but he says to the praise of the glory of His grace. So it's very specific what he's speaking of here in verse 6. He zooms in on the glorious grace of God, which leads us to the next point. And that is that God's grace is absolutely 
glorious, infinitely glorious. Let's continue. Verse 6, it says, to the praise, which we just looked at, and then it says, of the glory of his grace. This is the subject in question here in verse 6, and it is God's grace. Divine grace in its various varieties is a huge topic to cover. It's a huge subject to discuss, and it is way too much for one man to cover in a sermon. And I don't desire necessarily to do that in this sermon, but in relation to this verse, it is specifically speaking of the glory of God's grace. That's what's, that's what's being discussed here. It is God's glorious grace. Not just His grace in the general sense, but specifically God's glorious grace. And we know from the greater context, He's speaking of saving grace. Not common grace. Saving grace. Common grace being that which God bestows upon all people in various forms throughout our lives. No, He's talking about in this greater context, salvific grace. That is, the grace God pours out on certain people to save them. The elect, that being, namely. But even goes more specific than that. It's not just specific. It's not just salvific grace he's talking about. But it is the beauty. It is the glory of salvific grace. And it is this grace that is truly glorious. It has a particular majestic splendor about it. It is something that transcends all other grace. Because it's eternal, it's redeeming, it's unconditional, it's absolutely wonderful. It is intrinsically perfect. So perfect that its grandeur, its its beauty is divine. In fact, uh, sometimes when people eat a certain food or a dessert, they'll say it tastes so good, it tasted divine. Or they'll say, or let's say they had um, a good night's rest or a good nap, and they said that rest was glorious, it was divine. We use that word to describe something that is just so good, it's beyond description. And God's grace is divine. And that's why it uses the term glorious. Sometimes we bring the term glorious down and rub it in the mud and drag it through the dirt because it really ought not be used to describe anything on earth or anything that is experienced on earth. Even I myself am guilty of this. Oftentimes I'll use the word glorious to describe something. But we've taken that word, we've really, we've really stripped so much meaning from it because the word glorious, it carries with it that sense that this is divine. This is something that is of God and by God. And saving grace is glorious. Absolutely glorious. In fact, in the next chapter in Ephesians 2... Verse 7, Paul tells us that God has saved us, and I quote, he says, so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing, notice that surpassing, it goes beyond anything else, the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. It is, there, it is riches of grace. That's another way we could describe this saving grace. In fact, that God in salvation bestows so much grace upon the believer, they become rich. Filthy rich. You, dear saint, may be poor. You may have little in this world. Little friends, no family, no money, and very few material possessions. But I want you to know this, precious saint, precious in the eye, eyes of God, he has lavished riches of grace upon you, and he has saved you eternally. It is 
This grace is more valuable. It is more expensive. It is most expensive and yet most free. And what I mean by that expensive is that it is so valuable there's nothing that can purchase it. And yet it is freely given, which we'll see in a few moments. In fact, it's more valuable than the most expensive diamond in the world. There's nothing else like divine saving grace. The Greek word used here is charis, very, very common word in the New Testament. And it means favor, goodwill, loving kindness. And then, uh, but it carries with it also this sense, all apart from merit. That's truly the glory of, of God's grace, that it is something God gives to us free of charge. Something free of charge. It's not something we earn or something we grab hold of by ourselves. It is something God gives. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Many of you have heard this. Even perhaps some of you unbelievers have heard this. Paul writes, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. It is, it is the free grace of God. It is divine generosity. Romans 4, 5 To the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Romans 3, 28 For we maintain that a man is justified apart excuse me, justified by faith apart from the works of the law. It is by grace have we been saved. Unmerited favor. You could exchange that term, unmerited favor, for grace. That's exactly what grace means. Unmerited favor. God's riches at Christ's expense. It is this way. Salvation is this way, regardless of what any man or counsel or church says. The word of God has spoken thus, and salvation is by free grace. Free so come, you sinners, come, you lost, perverted souls who are awaiting the day of judgment, the day of trouble, when you will be cast into the pit of hell. Escape that wrath this day. Escape the judgment which it will befall you on that day. Escape it by grabbing hold of the free grace of God to the glory of God. Why is salvation this way? Why is salvation all of grace? Why would God instead, why wouldn't He make it half of Him and half of us? That would be contradiction of God's character. That would be in contradiction to His character. It would be Him compromising His character. Because we just saw what? God is jealous for what? His own glory, His own praise. And that is why the text reads, to the praise of of the glory of His grace. If salvation is not by grace, then God is not worthy of all the praise, and therefore He could not write these very words. But nonetheless, it is all by grace, and therefore He gets all the glory. It is by the grace of God, so that God gets the glory for it. People are inherently very proud, very self-serving and self-centered and self-loving. That's just man's nature intrinsically, that he loves himself. And he thinks himself to be good and righteous. He's prideful. He's filled with pride, self-love. And he really doesn't have humility, true humility. But how can this be removed? How can this pridefulness be stripped from man? It is through saving grace. 
when they begin to understand, when someone begins to grasp and to comprehend that salvation is a free gift from God, when a believer, when they are saved, they understand that God has saved them freely and by His grace alone and not by their works. They couldn't do anything to merit it, couldn't do anything even to receive it. Even the faith to receive God's saving grace in Christ was also a gift of grace. When they see that, it will make them humble. That's why Jesus said, Blessed are those who are humble. Blessed are those who are humble. Blessed are the meek. And as it is sometimes translated, for they shall inherit the earth. That's a, that's a mark of a genuine believer. The Beatitudes are marks of genuine believers. A genuine believer does not exalt himself, does not puff himself up, does not bring glory to himself. But he brings all the glory to God. He's humble. He's humbled. God has humbled him. Praise God that he has humbled those of us who have been saved by his grace. He has crushed our pride and ground it to dust. And He still does it. It's not like when we're saved, all, proud, all pride is gone and, and we're totally freed from pride. We never fall into the sin. We know even Peter fell into pride. So praise God, He is constantly grinding our pride to dust. And concerning this doctrine of grace was in total, and it still even to this day stands, in complete opposition to other religious beliefs. And in Paul's day, it was no different. Specifically, it was Judaism. We know this from the book of Galatians, which is the book prior to this book in the canon of Scripture in the New Testament. It goes Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. And in Galatians, Paul confronts the lie that the Judaizers had perpetrated among the churches at Galatia. That being that a man, in order to be a true Christian, a, a true follower of Christ, you had to be circumcised. you got to do your own performance in order to merit your right standing before God. And Paul destroys such a lie from the pit of hell in that book. It's glorious. Salvation is by grace. Regardless of what any man says, what any belief says, what any church says, what any council says, the word of God has spoke thus, by grace have you been saved. It is set in stone. The word of God will never pass away. And so we have this firm foundation to stand upon. But the question may arise, is God obligated to give this grace? Is God obligated to give this to anyone? Some say that... He is, and then go off of the the deep end, you, ought, you could say, they, they ex exit orthodoxy, and they step into the realm of heresy, when they say, well, God's going to save everybody. God is going to redeem everyone and bring them to eternal life, because he's obligated to. Must he save all? Certainly not. Our Lord Jesus himself said in Matthew 7, in verse 13, he said, the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. Many are on the way to destruction. So, not only does that text, though, out of Matthew 7... Provide us with the truth, the answer to this question. Well, God does not have to bestow it upon everyone. And he's already said that he won't, that many will go to hell. Even this passage in Ephesians 1 speaks to that as well. That God's grace is free. It's not a grace that's bound to distribute itself upon certain individuals. But it is absolutely free. Free to be poured out on whomever God wills to pour it out on. That's the second thing I want us to consider in this, in this study here, in this sermon, is secondly, God's gracious salvation in Christ. The first being that God does all that He does in salvation to the praise 
of His glorious grace. Now, secondly, God's gracious salvation in Christ. And let's look at the fact that God is not under obligation. Look at verse 6. It says, To the praise of the glory of His grace. And then this is the second half of verse 6. Which He freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. Those first four words there, which He freely bestowed, is, are what we're going to zoom in on and just and dig into for a few moments here. One of the most commonly heard objections is that from people as hell is not fair. It's not fair for God to send sinners to hell and to save others. But God's not bound in shackles, as we just considered and we saw from Matthew 7. He is the only free agent in salvation. In the epic of redemption, He is free to save whom He desires to save. If you dare say this about God, if you dare, if you dare throw a shackle upon Him which He Himself has said is not upon him, and he is not bound to give this to anybody, and he's not obligated to, you're going to be met with the divine reply that Paul gives to this objection. In Romans 9, verses 20 and 21, he writes, On the contrary, who are you, O man, who answers back to God? The thing will not say to the molder, Why did you make me like this, will it? Or does not the potter have a right of the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? God has the right, as verse 21 says. He has the right. No one questions when a painter paints with the same paint some paintings that he throws out and then others that he keeps and sells and puts on display. No one contends with a potter who uses some clay from the same lump to form vessels for honorable use, for food, to hold flowers in, or for common use, to hold trash in. In other words, God can do what He desires. And that's precisely what the text says. It says He freely, He freely gave it not out of obligation. Many people, when they contemplate and they consider election, which is what, again, in the context Paul is covering here in this in this section of Scripture, he's talking about God electing us unto, us unto salvation. Predestination, as what is commonly called. And the text even says predestination there in verse 5. Many people say, well, what happened was God in eternity past looked down into the future and saw that many people would believe upon Christ and so he chose them because they chose him. But that would that is very problem, problematic in many ways. One of the ways being obviously that's work salvation. Ultimately the reason you're if that's true, the ultimately the reason I'm converted and you're converted if you're a believer is that we have chosen. We we have been better than other people. But God does not see that when he looks down the corridor of time and he sees all that he was going to create and all that he had already ordained to come about. He saw the children of men and we're all equally sinful and none of us seek after God. Romans 3, none does any good, no one does any amount of righteousness, no one seeks for God. We've all turned aside, turned aside. we become useless. Instead, God in his grace chooses a select few totally out of his free will. Not because he saw some and said, mm, those are tall, they look like a great choice. Or, mm, some of those are smart, so they look like a great choice. No, we're all equal. On this equal plane of sinfulness and depravity and hatred of God. And God chooses a certain few to save. Which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved which he freely bestowed. Also, I want us to consider the Greek word that is used here, underlining this word bestowed. It reveals greatly what Paul's intent was when he wrote this. The Greek word for bestowed there is charistao, which is derived from the Greek word charis for grace, as we saw just a moment ago. So literally, what this is literally translated saying, Paul saying, he freely graced us. 
God has graced us with grace. Sometimes this phrase is used even in our culture today. Very rarely it was used more in, uh, in previous generations and in older times. They would say, um, sometimes in conversation, if, if two people are talking, let's say, about uh, an event or a dance or a dinner they were at the night before, and someone rich or someone famous, someone who was highly admired, showed up and appeared at this dinner or at this dance or at this social gathering, they would say that so-and-so, this certain person, graced us with their presence because their presence was it was, it was a, a good thing to have their presence there it speaks with favoring someone with granting someone a gift and when in use in this context concerning God giving us salvation it's very clear what Paul's saying he's graced us he's favored us he's poured out riches and blessing and love upon us freely in Christ in fact, he's showing us the multi-layered glories of salvation. Salvation is multifaceted and multi-layered. It's like a diamond. When you, when you hold a diamond up to the light, and you, just, you just turn it and rotate it in different ways. Or you hold up a diamond ring and you, you turn it and you look at it from different angles, you're, all, you're going to see something gorgeous, beautiful. It's going to look slightly different. Salvation is very similar. When we look at it from different angles and different fashions and, and look at it at different layers, we see the glories, the multifaceted glories of salvation. Christ gives sinners grace upon grace. That's exactly what John wrote in John 1.16. He said, For of His fullness, that's Christ, we have all received and grace upon grace. Speaking specifically here in Ephesians 1, 6, the Holman Christian, excuse me, the, the, um, the, the Holman Christian Bible says this in its rendering of verse 6. It says, to the praise of His glorious grace that he favored us with in the beloved. I like that translation. It's a very good translation of, of the original text there. It's a very good rendering. Father graciously graced us with grace in Jesus Christ our Lord. That's three forms of the word grace there in that sentence. And that leads us to the next point. And that is the elect being the objects of divine grace. Because the next two words that we find here in, in verse 6 is, it says, To the praise of the glory of His grace, which He freely bestowed on us. Two words there, on us. Brethren, we are the objects of God's divine love and mercy. This grace that we have referenced and spoken on and, con and contemplated, God has given to us. How precious is this indeed? The elect have been a part of the whole subject of Ephesians 1. It's all about God's dealing, the Son's dealing, the Spirit's dealing with the elect. Because in the, in the epic of salvation, in the, in the redemptive drama of salvation, there have to be recipients. There has to be recipients of divine grace. And the recipients are the elect, the church of Jesus Christ. That's why in verse 3 of this chapter, he says, Blessed be the God and Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. He just begins right at the outside saying that we're the recipients of these graces. He just didn't say, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed with every spiritual blessing. No, he said, Who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. In verses three and five, it also three through five, excuse me, also emphasizes that we are the recipients of this saving redemptive work. In fact, Paul uses the word "us" five times in the first twelve verses, which is a lot, and even the the word "us" there five times as well in the verse first twelve verses of this chapter. How great it is to be a beloved child of God. John, 1 John uh, chapter 3, verse 1, he says, See how great the love the Father has bestowed on us, that we would be called the children of God. 
Jesus said in John 15, 9, Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Praise God for the love that He has bestowed upon us indeed. Notice though that Jesus says in verse 9 of John 15, as I just read, He says that this love eternally existed between the members of the Trinity, but specifically the Father and the Son in that verse. Specifically between the Father and the Son. And this is the love that I want us to also consider. Let us not only consider the fact that we are recipients of this divine love, this divine grace specifically spoken of here in verse 6, but there's also, at the end of verse 6, reference to an intra-Trinitarian love, an intra-Trinitarian. That simply means that it is, it is within the members of the Trinity. There is a specific love, an eternal love that exists between the members of the Trinity. How do we know this? The end of verse 6 says, on us in the beloved. The Greek here is, is a form of the Greek word for love, the Greek word akape. And this word is, a, is in the present participle. And it's better translated, the one having been loved. Christ in eternity past was in perfect love and harmony with the Father and the Holy Spirit. The Father loved the Spirit, the Spirit loved the Son, the Son loved the Spirit, the Son loved the Father. There is just this glorious intra-Trinitarian love. In fact, I wish I could spend more time on this, this reality because there's just something so glorious about beholding the interaction between the members of the Trinity. The, between the divine persons who all partake of the, the divine essence in nature, the being of God. But time will flee from me way too quickly if I were to do so. So we will have to move on quickly through this. But to look at some scriptural proofs of this concept is in John 3, uh, 35. Th see, this idea is found all throughout scripture, but one of the places it's found very clearly put, very clearly taught is in the book of John, the Gospel of John. And so in John 3.35, the Apostle writes, he says, The Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hand. John 10.17, Jesus said, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. At Jesus' baptism, this is out of Matthew, Matthew 3.17, The Father declared from heaven, He said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Uh, in John 5.20, it says, For the Father loves the Son and shows Him all things that He Himself is doing. John 14.31, But so that the world may know that I love the Father, and I do exactly as the Father commanded me. Understanding this love between the members of the Trinity makes us appreciate and grow in a glorious understanding of the cross because when you understand how much it costs the father it it grieved the father to send his son and then to unleash his wrath on his son yes we talk and we speak about how it pleased the wrath of god and it certainly did and it certainly pleased god's justice but how often do we contemplate the reality that it, it broke the father's heart it broke the son it grieved him to be separated, to be cut off from the grace of the Father whom he eternally existed with in beautiful communion and glorious face-to-face -face interaction. It's truly glorious to consider his intra-Trinitarian love. Oh, dear saints, my dear brethren, rest today in these precious realities. The truth of Scripture brings much joy to your life and mine. So think upon it. Meditate upon the Word of God. Delight in the Word of God. Delight in these truths. Rest in the reality of God's abundant love for us. And even think about, as I said, how glorious it is to think about the intra-Trinitarian love that exists between the members of the Trinity. They have this, this glorious eternal love for one another. And you unbelievers, 
I call you to be saved from this perverse generation. Be saved from your sins. You desire a great salvation in Christ? Come, come to Him and be saved. You've heard how God is so gloriously gracious, how God is so merciful to sinners in Christ, His Son, but it is only found in Christ. He is the safe haven on the day of wrath, so flee to Him before it is too late. Repent and believe the gospel of grace. In conclusion, we have seen here in Ephesians 1.6, that this passage speaks clearly to this gracious and glorious salvation that we have in Jesus Christ, our King. That God does it all to the praise of the glory of His grace. And truly, how glorious is this free grace He has bestowed on us in Christ. This is all by God and by His power. This God, Yahweh, is holy. Oh, God is so holy and so pure. Merciful, loving, and gracious, yes. As, and even, as I mentioned earlier, gracious even to everyone in a common way, in a, in a very generic sense. But God is just, a just judge. He's put forth His law to show us His holiness. God says, you shall not lie or fornicate, you shall not steal, you shall not blaspheme. These commands God's given reflect to us the character of God, who He is. God says not to lie because he's not a liar. God says not to steal because he's not a, a thief. God says not to commit adultery or any sexual perversion because he's a faithful covenant-keeping God. But mankind has fallen short of keeping that law. We have broken the law. In fact, I don't have to convince you, for you know it. You know that you've broken God's law. You have a conscience. You know that you have lied before and that you have stolen, that you have looked with lust, which is adultery in the heart, as Jesus said in Matthew 5. You may say, well, I have never committed murder. Well, Jesus himself said in Matthew 5 that if you have anger towards someone else, an unjustified sinful anger, that, that you are just as guilty as a murderer and you deserve to be thrown into the eternal flame. See, if God sees even our hearts and minds and he sees we've broken his law, we deserve his punishment for sin. We deserve the eternal wrath of God against us and our sin. That's why hell exists. It is God unleashing his eternal justice upon the wicked because we've broken his law. Just as a murderer who breaks a law here on earth must undergo the punishment for his law breaking, so too with the Holy One of glory. So too with him, when we break his law, we deserve his punishment. But in his love toward his elect people, toward his church, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to fulfill the law which we broke, and then to be stretched upon the cross to satisfy God's wrath, died on that cross as a sacrifice, as the perfect lamb of God. He spilled his blood there at the tree. Isaiah 53.10 says, It pleased Yahweh to crush him. The wrath of God was unleashed upon His Son. And as we talked about that inter-Trinitarian inter love, oh, how glorious and yet how heartbreaking it is to consider what was happening at that cross. That the Father was grieved to do it, the Son was grieved, yet pleased to do it for His own glory. For it pleased His justice. And he rose again on the third day. Jesus rose from the grave. He is alive today. Jesus is alive. Praise God, he is alive. He's been raised. And he's alive forevermore. That is the grace of God. That's the glorious saving grace of God. That we've broken God's law, yes, but Jesus paid the fine. He paid the bail. We can leave the prison. We can leave the courtroom and be forgiven by the judge. Come, repent and believe. Turn from your sin. Flee your idolatry. Flee your selfishness. Flee all your sins. And believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Take God at His word. Believe the promises of God as they're revealed in Christ. And you will be eternally, perfectly justified forevermore in Christ. God will forgive you of all your sins because Jesus died for them and you'll be wrapped in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. God will look at you as if you lived His life because He looked at Christ as if He lived yours. That's the great exchange of the gospel. Christ takes my sin, I get His righteousness. That's the beauty of it. Oh, how glorious it is to remember the gospel of grace. 
And brethren, this gospel is for you today. Remember that God has forgiven you of your sin. Do you walk around with a guilty conscience? You need not. For Christ has borne our guilt. He has taken our sin upon himself and has paid the fine for it. And he has wrapped us in his righteousness. Therefore rest knowing we are pleasing in the eyes of God. Not because we have done anything, but because God in his grace has bestowed salvation upon us. Oh, you lost sinner, it is by grace. Come to God through faith in Christ. For that is the only way to receive God's gracious gift of eternal life. Indeed, to God be the glory for this. To God be the glory for this wonderful, wonderful gospel and the wonderful, wonderful economy of salvation that the Father elects, the Son atones, the Spirit regenerates. Perfect agreement, perfect unity, perfect love. To God, to the triune God, to the one true God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one and three, three and one, to this God alone be glory, honor, praise, and adoration forever. I want to end off with a reading from Ephesians chapter 3. Just two chapters over. In verse 20, Paul says, Now to him who is able to keep, excuse me, uh, to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And amen. Let us close in a word of prayer. O gracious God, I ask and plead with you to save souls through this message and to encourage your people and ultimately and chiefly to bring glory to your name. O God, how we praise you. How I praise you, Lord, for your love and your grace you have bestowed upon me and all of your elect people. Hallelujah. May you be glorified in us, in your people as we walk, as we seek to walk in holiness. Amen and amen.